Welcome to today's very special event, Law, Not War, from the Nuremberg Trials to Today. With two tireless, lifelong advocates for human rights and justice, Ben Ferenz and Zaid Rad al Hussein. We're so honored that you could both join us for this discussion today and thank you for taking the time. As most of you already know, Ben Ferenz served as the Chief Prosecutor for the United States in the Einzengruppen trial, one of the military tribunals for war crimes and crimes against humanity held in Nuremberg after the Second World War. He charged 22 defendants from the Nazi SS with murdering over a million people, known as the biggest murder trial in history. It was also his first case, not bad. He had received a JD from Harvard Law School in 1943 and then promptly joined the US Army. He fought at Normandy Beach in every major campaign uh, in Europe. Since then, he has dedicated his life to lobbying for peace, obtaining compensation for victims, and preventing illegal war making. In conversation with him today will be Zaid Rad Al Hussein, our moderator. He helped set the legal precedent. Uh, he helped bring the legal precedent that Ben started the Nuremberg trial into reality with the International Criminal Court. As the first president of the Assembly of States Party to the Rome Statute, he oversaw the election of the court's first judges, mediated selection of its first president, and led the efforts to name its first uh, prosecutor. He went on to serve as Jordan's permanent representative to the United Nations and ambassador to the United States, and also as United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And we're really fortunate to have him spending time with us now in residence as Perry Worldhouse Professor of Practice of Law and Human Rights. This is a particularly appropriate week for this event as tomorrow marks the anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, adopted tomorrow, December 9th, 1948. The next day, the UN adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as well. I look forward to hearing both of your thoughts on how this issue area has evolved over time. And Zaid, uh, let me turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Mike. And uh, Ben, a uh, warm welcome to you. It's a huge honor to be able to engage with you today in front of this uh, audience from uh, Perry World House and the University of Pennsylvania. I have uh, four questions for you, Ben, and we'll, we'll try and fit them into about 35 minutes and then take questions from the audience as uh, Mike just explained. Now it's almost received uh, wisdom that violence is practiced largely by brutish individuals. The implication being that a thinking person an educated person is also a civilized person, a moral person who spurns violence. If one follows this logic, your experiences at Nuremberg reveal something deeply unsettling or unnerving for humanity because many of the defendants who commanded the Einsatzgruppen, the Nazi death squads, and who you prosecuted so successfully were not uneducated, a surprising number were the opposite, highly educated individuals, and yet also capable of the most extreme inhumanity, Ollendorf, Rush, Blobel. Uh, ben, if you could please tell us who these defendants were and how they justified their cold-blooded mass murder of innocents, and, and what possible broader explanation could there be for their staggering collapse of conscience? It's a very uh, interesting question and an important question. And uh, I mold that over as I was sitting, writing my opening statement. Uh, it was a Sunday, the trial opened on Monday. And I thought, I have these defendants selected, limited to 22 because that was the number that the International Military Tribunal, which had preceded me, uh, they, had, they didn't have more seats in the courtroom. And I had absolutely clear proof in their own official reports sent daily to the headquarters in Berlin, how many Jews they had killed and how many gypsies and others. And uh, I thought, and I had added them up on the editing machine and I had a million, when I had a million, I flew from Berlin where I was in charge of collecting evidence for the trials, flew down and spoke to my boss then, General Telford Taylor. And I said, we have to put on a new trial. He said, we can't. Uh, Pentagon has approved the budget. They're not so keen on any of these trials anymore. So we're never gonna get approval for that. And I said, you can't let these guys go. I've got in my hands here proof, daily proof of mass murder 
on on heralded scale. You can't let these bastards go. And he said, well, can you do it in addition to your other responsibilities? And I said, sure. He said, okay, you'll do it. And so it came to pass that I was my, my first case, the first time I'd ever been in the courtroom <laughs> for the biggest murder trial in history. And I'm sitting there on a Sunday and say, what do you ask for? I have 22 defendants carefully selected by me based upon their rank and their education. There'll be no enlisted men in my doc, I said, because when I got into the army as an honor graduate, full scholarship on the Harvard Law School, they made me a buck private in the army and let me do cleaning the toilets again and again and again, Say you're a Howard man doing better than that. Uh, and that's my army career. And I thought, I'm not gonna have any enlisted men. I ruled them out. I'm gonna select people of the highest rank and the highest education. And I, so I had about six or nine SS generals and in the others, I had one who was a double doctor, Dr. Dr. Rush, who mentioned him in passing. I think he killed 33,771 Jews on 29 and 7, 27 September, 1941. Um, and um, I said, what can I do with 22 to balance the scales of justice against a million murders? I said, there's nothing I can do. Uh, there never can be justice done in the sense of justice. But if I can get a rule of law, which will protect everybody, uh, that would be of something of value. And so I asked the tribunal in my opening statement, um, they had been selected by me, the defendants, because the Jews were different considered a threat to them, and the communists were also a threat to them. And uh, if they didn't share the religion or the race of, uh, uh, of, of their executions, they were marked for death. And I want the court to pass a rule that every human being is entitled to live in peace and human dignity, regardless of his race or creed. That is what it was, should be. And I said, this is a crime against humanity, which has occurred here. And uh, I think the judgment of the court recognized that and said as much in their judgment. So that's how we ended up with uh, 22 defendants only. And what I was trying to prove by taking these high-ranking and well-educated people. Your question of uh, how come um, takes a little bit longer to answer that, sorry. But uh, Ollendorf explained that he acted in self-defense. He said, where do you come off with self-defense? Germany attacked France, Holland, Belgium, Holland. No one was attacking Germany. He said, yes, but we knew, Hitler told us, and I can challenge Hitler, that uh, the Russians were planning to attack us. And therefore, we acted in self-defense. And uh, all the legal experts have given us the opinion that, that was perfectly legal. So he used the argument, uh, which the judges rejected completely. They accepted my argument that this was not the law and couldn't be the law. And uh, it became vivid to me recently when our past, our old president uh, uh, spoke to the United Nations General Assembly as the representative of the United States, the first appearance of the president of the United States. He made the point and he said, I'm talking to the head of North Korea now, if you challenge us or threaten us or any of our allies, we will totally destroy you. So this is for the Ollendorf defense. He's pleading the Ollendorf defense and he'll totally destroy us. I said to myself, how do you totally destroy a country? You go out and machine gun everybody? Is that what you're going to do? Is that what you're threatening to do? when two, um, three American judges all held that was a crime which justified our hanging Ollendorf, the father of five children, and an honest and intelligent doctor out of Ollendorf. 
So it comes down to your question. Uh, the United States was ready to hang him. Uh, and uh, he was hanged. Um, you were asking me, what's their mentality? How did I pick them? They'll be shocked to hear they were not criminals with horns on their head. Uh, they were serious patriots, patriots for their country, ready to give their lives for their country. I obliged them and let them do that. Uh, but uh, uh, this carries over and has carried over in your question, uh, because it is, are these all madmen? No, they're not. They were selected because of their high rank in education. And in their pleading, and Ollendorf made the classic case, and I, the only one I talked to in my, in the whole trial, the only man I talked to eye to eye was Oliver Ollendorf, and I knew he was sure to hang. I went down to the death house and talked to him because he had five kids, and I thought he didn't want to leave some words. And he said, you'll see, I was right. Hitler was right. Uh, we did it in self-defense. So uh, the people that you ask about, how are they, are they madmen or are they villains? Or, uh, they are not. They were selected by their education. I'm sure they were kind to their cats and dogs. Uh, they saw themselves as the president of the United States saw himself, outgoing president, uh, as acting in the interest of his country uh, to go and attack somebody else. And that's what it was all about. So uh, how do you deal with that? Mm. We'll come to that uh, later in the program. But the answer mm. to your question is that they were not madmen, they were not villains, they were not devils. They were selected by me on the basis of being intelligent, patriotic Germans yeah. whose patriotism led them to become mass murderers, which they were, and it was for that that they were killed. So if I could uh, touch on this or pick up from this and just stay with the US for a moment, um, I'd like to turn to Sir Hartley Shawcross's summing up for the British delegation at the main tribunal, the yeah. IMT, the International Military Tribunal, the main trial in July um, of 1946, because Shawcross referred to Goethe when he noted, and I quote, he said something like, he, Goethe, spoke of the German nation one day submitting to any mad scoundrel who appeals to their lowest instincts and teaches them to conceive nationalism as isolation and brutality. Now, now, Ben, you were born as a European. Your family moved to the US soon after you were born and you grew up as a proud American, a soldier who fought for his country in World War II. You've been extremely vocal about the Trump administration's policy of separating migrant children from their families. You've called it a, a crime against humanity. Yes. And as a one time immigrant infant yourself, I assume it was all deeply personal for you. Are you worried about what you've seen in the US over the last four years? Well, I hope that what I have seen will be for the last four years will be changed in the future years. And this, did it cause me concern? Yes, it did. Uh, I think to snatch a child away from its mother uh, some of them suckling babes and say, we'll take care of the baby. Don't worry about him. You just go back to where you came from. Uh, that seemed to me to be an inhumane act, a crime against humanity, because it causes unlimited suffering on the part of innocent people. And uh, I was very much concerned about that. And I was not quiet about it either. I called it a crime against humanity. And there are other crimes committed by our government which gives me grave concern, but I'm hopeful that uh, the change will be coming very soon. And uh, I am aware of the progress we have been making very slowly, but there has been real progress, thanks to you partly also for teaching human rights and insisting upon human rights. 
And uh, so I'm optimistic for the future, uh, although I'm realistic for what has been the past. And that gave, gave cause to pessimism at the time. So we are a largely academic crowd here and there are students who are also uh, participating. Before my next question though, uh, Ben, a short story. Uh, 10 years ago, as, as you'd recall, uh, at the review conference for the International Criminal Court in Kampala, Uganda, and I was chairing the working group on the crime of aggression, the supreme international crime. Um, after two days of or negotiations, or I think after the first day of negotiation, I realized that we were fast becoming stuck, mired in detail, in technical detail, uh, and we were losing the plot. So in the early hours of uh, that day, I think in the, actually it was the, you know, it was early evening of that particular day, and all the delegations had finished speaking. And if you'd recall, there were 193 delegations sitting in front and then the civil society delegations in the back. And you were the only person at the conference sitting behind your own name. So alongside Amnesty and Human Rights Watch. So I spoke to one of my assistants and said, could you please call Ben up? And you came up to the podium and I asked you to help me or help all of us. You took the microphone and you urged us in almost elegiac terms not to forget the millions and millions of people, innocent people who suffered the effects of war, not to overlook what it was that we were trying to achieve. It was elegant uh, and uh, there was some humor as well, but it was a real you know, kick to the gut and we needed it. Although one of the negotiators, I don't know if you remember this, an ambassador who was new to the whole process and didn't know you, came up to protest and said, who is this Ben Ferenc? You know, he's, he doesn't even represent an NGO. So I, I very calmly told, <laughs> told him that you represented, you were counsel for our common conscience. And next day we closed the gap. You have always spoke of the need to get rid of war that that is the condition that gives rise to so much wickedness. Um, if short of that, we have to try and better fortify our consciences, and you have been a law professor yourself, would you not agree with me? There is too much emphasis today at school, in colleges, uh, in law lecture halls, too much emphasis on the acquisition of technical knowledge and skill, seemingly at the expense of a deeper and needed morality, which is what we needed as negotiators. We needed you to infuse us with this sense of morality. Otherwise, we would have argued endlessly on, on the technical detail. But would you not agree? That oh, I agree. I agree absolutely with that. Uh, so much so that you reminded me uh, that when I opened up the conference, uh, in Rome, uh, I represent nobody. Uh, it's been the same. Nobody pays me. Nobody can tell me what to do. Uh, but uh, my opening statement was: I have come to Rome to speak for those who cannot speak, the victims. And uh, I have felt very strongly that uh, too much attention has been paid to too many technical difficulties. Defining aggression, for example. I wrote, I don't know, two big volumes and hundreds of little articles on defining aggression. Uh, they didn't really want to define aggression. They were just looking for a stall. The United States was using that as an excuse. They never came with a better definition. Uh, and uh, so they have come with technicalities because they weren't prepared to do what needed to be done for those who could, could not speak. I spoke for those whose parents, parents had been killed, whose families had been wiped out and not only talked for them. I saw that happening as a liberator of many concentration camps, which was my assignment in the army as a sergeant of infantry. I wore no insignia because I couldn't do my job. I pretended I was General Patton. And I'd go and tell the commanding officer of the camp, I've got to get immediate access to the records of this group and so on. Uh, but uh, 
uh, it's hard for me to describe really. Um, it was an obligation on my part, a moral obligation to speak for those who couldn't speak, those who were killed. Uh, and, and by the thousands, my reports that they, they wrote in the Einsatzgruppen case, nobody can pronounce it, uh, were daily reports. And they totaled a million innocent men, women, and children killed simply because of their race, they were Jews, or they were considered useless criminals or something of that kind. So, so but, the question. Uh, so how can we, how can we sort of immunize ourselves, and especially the younger members of this audience who may be, you know, exceedingly clever, have a very good basis of understanding how do we encourage them to develop this sort of the moral conscience to a point where they don't in the future ever fall into a trap where you do not speak out, do not represent people who, is there something that we need to change in the way that we teach, for example? Yes, yes. we have to change the hearts and minds of people. You can't change the mind until you've changed the heart. They have to recognize the, the notion which we try to develop crimes against humanity. Uh, the people who do cruel things like say, taking the children away from their parents and uh, even suckling babes away. This is so cruel that it must be criminal and we must criminalize it. And we must recognize an obligation to share our concerns and the concerns of others. We are all members of one small planet. I wrote a book on it called Planethood. The theme was, we're all inhabitants of one small planet and we must use the resources on that planet to assure everybody the right to live in peace and dignity. And it can be done and it can be done, but it can't be done if one says, no, no, I have to have Cadillacs and I have to have farms and I have to have this and that and the rest of it's their problem. We've got to get away from that. We are all members of one planet. Mm -hmm. And this requires a change in thinking. And for that reason, I have supported groups like the Harvard Divinity School and uh, Harvard University, of course, uh, uh, who recognize the need to think in different terms. We cannot think my country right or wrong. That was Hitler, Deutschland über alles. We've had echoes in Washington fairly recently, but we recognize as human beings, there's an obligation to behave in a human way. And from what I experienced and saw in action was the most inhumane and, and cruel type of response of people who had power. And uh, so we have to, and it's up to the young people to ask themselves, you want to be the greatest country on the world? We have the best guns, so we're going to kill everybody if you don't agree. That's a John Bolton uh, argument. So we don't have to talk to anybody else. We know what's best. We're Americans. Well, that will end up with Hitler what ended up killing millions of innocent people. Mm -hmm. uh, and as far as the attitude of the German leaders, uh, my lead defendant, Dr. Otto Ohlendorf, father of five children, killed, according to his reports, 90,000 Jews. Mm -hmm. But he said, well, he wasn't sure of the count because the men were inclined to exaggerate the body count. But 60 or 70,000, that was it. So they were bragging about the number they killed in the hope of getting a promotion. What a confession that is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the world in which we live, where we have glorified killing even innocent people, which every war kills lots of innocent people, mostly innocent people, I would say. Uh, we have glorified what we should be condemning. And uh, we have done that for centuries. So it's going to take courage, new thinking, young minds, young minds to think of their obligation. And it's in some ways easier for the people today uh, because if you get knowledgeable, and I'm sure that Pace University and 
and Pennsylvania University will, will be teaching that. We have the capacity today from cyberspace to cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars perfecting that. Trouble is the Russians can do it. The Chinese can do it. I don't know who else can still do it. Uh, I, when I was told this in confidence 10 years ago, now it's common knowledge by an American general, we were together in St. Petersburg, Russia at a peace conference of kind. And I said, what are you up to these days, General? He said, I'm working on the cyberspace problem. I'd never heard of that. I said, what's that? He said, well, you know, uh, now we can cut off the electrical grid on planet Earth. I said, no, I, I didn't know that. How long would it take for everybody to die? He said, well, I'm not aware of any studies which have been made on that, but uh, my guess is that it would depend upon the amount of water they had. If they had enough water, um, they could probably live for about a week. Said, oh my God, if they had enough water, they could live for a week. What happens then when we decide the state of Washington or Florida should disappear and we, we send a cyberspace weapon? I don't have been in touch with the secret details, but I'm sure that possibility will exists. That's the new world for the young generation. You're living under a cloud, which is worse than anything that I experienced. Uh, they were just trying to kill all the Jews and kill anybody else who opposed them. We kill everybody, hooray for us. Kids, you gotta wake up. It's not how much water you can drink, it's how much intelligence and humanity you can bring to govern you and, and your governments. And that's a point of education along moral lines. And you have done a great job in your human rights activity in the United Nations of working on that problem, because that's got to be done first. First, you have to realize the need for change. If you just think all you need is more guns, we have the current situation where you spend billions of dollars every day designed to kill more people. Whereas if you'd use that money to take care of the legitimate complaints of many people, you wouldn't have them attacks and terrorist attacks record. Okay? So we're doing it upside down. And uh, I hope that some of your viewers and others, the young students will recognize that. And uh, I can't stop trying to change it, but I'm getting on in years, as you may have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Next one will be 102. Mm -hmm. uh, so I need help, kids. I need help. I need help. People like you, I need leaders from people like you. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long answer to a short question. Mm -hmm. well, well, Ben, I, I think many young people also need, you know, role models, role models of who, who speak moral clarity, who speak moral to moral consistency. And uh, the, are the epitome of, of integrity and courage. And I always think of you in that vein. And I also think of your great friend and former law partner, your boss at Nuremberg, Telford Taylor. Uh, would you give the audience a sense for who Telford was and whether or the, to what extent he influenced your thinking and your commitment to, to justice and ending war? Yes, I would be very happy to do that. Uh, because Telford is now dead and gone, not forgotten. Um, I first met Telford Taylor when I was discharged, honorably discharged as a sergeant of infantry by the United States Army and awarded five battle stars. I said, what's that for? I was no hero. He said, well, you landed on Normandy Beach. And I said, yeah, I landed on Normandy Beach. You went through the Maginot Line. No, I went through the Rhine. You went through the Siegfried Line. Yeah. You crossed the Rhine on the Quantum Bridge. Yeah, yeah, I did all that. But I didn't get killed. He said, that's why we're giving you the map. <laughs> you didn't get killed or wounded. I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> why do you just kill those who managed to <laughs> glorify those who managed to get killed? Anyway. Uh, uh, so I met Telford and uh, I was looking for a job. The war was over. Uh, they had treated me not kindly, but eventually they promoted me from private to a sergeant. Uh, most of the 
fatalities in wars are sergeants. And uh, uh, I got a cable from Washington, dear sir, uh, he never called me sir in three years of service. Uh, we'd like to talk to you. So I came to Washington, I met in the Pentagon, uh, and uh, he said, we want to set up a dozen additional trials in addition to the International Military Tribunal trial, which is famous Justice Jackson represented the United States. And uh, um, we, uh, we want to give the Germans a more comprehensive picture, not just this snapshot of a few leaders, how it is that the doctors perform medical experiments and the lawyers were perverting the law and the foreign, the SS were murdering the people. We want to give them a complete picture and tell for Taylor is going to be in charge of that. And uh, so I met with Telford, I hadn't known him before. And uh, he said, uh, we've been checking up on your record in the army. And he said, uh, I've got this assignment and uh, your name has come up. But uh, when I checked your army record, uh, they said you were being uh, insubordinate. I said, no, I wasn't being insubordinate. I just wouldn't obey an order, which I know was illegal or stupid. <laughs> I said, I don't think I've checked up on you too. He was also a Harvard Law graduate. And I said, I don't think you'll give me that kind of an order. In that case, you can't find a better man. And he said, you go with me. <laughs> and he hired me, okay? And, uh, and uh, he hired me knowing that I might be occasionally insubordinate. Uh, but he said, look, we've got suspects in the prison here in Nuremberg, but we have no evidence. We need evidence. Without evidence, you can't convict. So you go get the evidence. You know what evidence is necessary. Go wherever you have to, collect the evidence against these particular defendants. And I had a list of them, number of suspects. And um, we need that. So we go forward. I, I said, OK, I took off. I got myself 50 people or so former German refugees, many of them, uh, to go through the archives in Germany and Berlin uh, and uh, get their reports. There I came upon the reports of this unpronounceable Einsatzgruppen. It was deliberately kept uh, a difficult name. It doesn't say anything. Einsatz means action, action groups. Their assignment was, one, you go out and you kill all the Jews, all of them, without pity or remorse, men, women, and children. That was their assignment, 3,000 men. And I had their daily reports, how many they killed, where, in which town. I said, Telford, we have to put on a new trial. He said, they can't. They're never going to approve it. I said, you can't let these guys go. And he said, well, can you do it in addition to your other activities? And I said, sure. Okay, you're it. So to answer some of the young people's questions, how did a young guy like me, I was 27 years old, get the assignment? I'd never been in a courtroom. <laughs> I, I had been an undergraduate at the Harvard Law School. They'd given me a complete scholarship on my exam on criminal law. Uh, but I have a lot of confidence. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And so I proceeded to do that. And I, for the benefit of your students, broke every record in the book. I arrested the prosecution's case in two days, two days. Eat your heart out, all the prosecutors will come after me. I convicted all of them. And 11 of them were sentenced to death. 13 were sentenced to death, but two of them took a normal death. We don't count that. Uh, and uh, so it was a fantastic record uh, of achievement as a student. And I said, that's easy. They said, weren't you nervous? I was nervous. I didn't kill anybody. They were nervous, and I could prove it. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, it wasn't complicated. I, don't, I, I didn't call a single witness. I could have had a thousand witnesses. I said, I have the best documentary evidence from my exam in criminal law. If you have a contemporaneous document at the time, official, sent to their headquarters, that's good evidence, mister. <laughs> you can't beat that. So I rested my case in two days and convicted all of them. And uh, well, so. And, and uh, both of you, uh, though, Ben, both of you 
and Telford's record was also superb. But and both of you basically after Nuremberg, you remain sort of outspoken on many of these issues. I mean, Telford had uh, gained, I mean, prominence at Nuremberg, but he was also known for his stance on taking a position against uh, Senator McCarthy. You were both vocal on the Vietnam War. In, in other words, Nuremberg really marked you in, in the most positive way for all of us who've been campaigning on these issues, but marked you uh, for the rest of your life, yeah? Well, Telford was responsible for the 12 trials. He was the chief of counsel, that was his thing. Uh, eventually he made me executive counsel because we got to be very friendly for various reasons. Uh, and uh, when the war was over, he had the same problem I would run into. Uh, he went to the big law firms. Uh, they wanted to know which clients he could bring. Uh, it asked me also, what how many clients could you bring? The only clients I had, the only people I knew were people had a tattoo on their arm. That's all they had left. Or they didn't want us very much. And uh, so Telford was then setting up. He had already been in office for, and been looking for a job also for a while. And uh, so we became law partners. And uh, I took the desk of Dean Landis of the Harvard Law School, uh, who was not available. And uh, uh, we became very close friends also because of having to parachute out of a plane together. Uh, could, you tell, could you tell the audience very quickly the story and then we'll move to their questions because it is a remarkable story. This. Well, it, it just shows you the close friends. I'll end the first question first because he was a superb lawyer, excellent lawyer. And uh, uh, he became a law professor afterwards when the law business was going very well. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't consider it a business. And uh, uh, when we became partners there, and uh, he was, we also, we, most of the cases we had were human rights cases. Uh, we had Senator McCarthy who was out to condemn everybody who didn't follow his perception of what was right and wrong. And we had uh, people who had objected to the military service. And, uh, and, and Telford was a, a terrible as a business getter. <laughs> we didn't do very well from that point of view. But it was, uh, we really took on some of the tough moral questions, which were more important to him and certainly also to me. And uh, I, uh, I missed him. He went to teach at Columbia Law School finally. And, uh, uh, and I went my way, also trying to find my way. Um, so I miss him as a human being and as a partner and as a friend uh, who've been through tough times together, different kinds. And uh, I'm glad that you mentioned him because his name is not well known. Uh, everybody knows about the uh, uh, International Military Tribunal but they don't know much about the subsequent proceedings where he was the, in charge of the 12 subsequent trials and uh, nothing happened there without his knowledge and consent. Later, I became executive counsel, also helped wind up those trials and close them down. Uh, but uh, uh, the spirit of Telford remained with all those who were concerned with justice and the rule of law, and I was one of them. Fantastic. And the parachuting, you both jumped Well, that the... was a parachute uh, incident, which people like to hear about because they, they like to hear gruesome stories. Uh, I was in charge of the office in Berlin. I had about 50 people going through the archives of all the German ministries looking for stuff. And he would come up occasionally and talk with John Clay and some of the other people in charge. Uh, and. Uh, we had a special military aircraft for that, two engine C-47. Uh, and he was on his way home. We'd spent a couple of days and taken his wife along. And uh, I took my, I had my wife living with me in Berlin. And we were flying, he was, we were all flying back to Nuremberg. And uh, we were in the air for about five minutes when the pilots came out. And they, looked very shaken. He said, I can't maintain altitude. 
He said, everybody put the chutes on. We had to hook the parachute on this harness, which was required when you enter a military aircraft, you always put on the harness first. And so he put, we hooked the parachutes on. He said, don't forget the count to 10. Everybody out. <laughs> My wife was sitting next to me. <laughs> Kelvin, Mary Taylor's wife was five months pregnant. We're sitting down further down. We had another one of our lawyers and wife were there. So we all headed for the exit, climbing up to the tail of the plane. Of course, I got there first. I got my wife had to drag her along with me. She was getting kind of nervous. And I was pushing the door. And when that machine was built, I suppose in Kentucky or someplace like that, he said, if you pull the ripcord and the handle, the door will jump off. Well, I pulled the handle, but the wind was blowing the door shut. So I couldn't open the door. And I was pushing it with my knee. And all of a sudden, the door opened and I fell out. I counted one, two, ten, and pulled the ripcord. And the thing popped open. And I said, oh, my God, everybody's going to get killed. And I'm going to survive. And to show what a hypocrite I was, I didn't really want to get killed. I said, I got to juggle this shoot. How does this damn thing work? You know? I try to try to cruise around, and I saw a ball field out. It looked pretty empty. Some kids playing soccer. I said, "Well, oh, I can. I, I want to hit there." The rest of the, the ruins of Berlin, and everything was wrecked. You know. All right. So I bang. Anyway, I finally I landed right in the middle of the field. I ran quickly. Said, "We got a phone." They, it was rare in those days. Reached a phone. Got a phone. Called the airport. Said, "Listen, tell uh, General planes crashing." Send everybody out. Where am I? I said, kids, where am I? <laughs> and I was in the, uh, I was in the Soviet zones. Uh, there was the, Berlin had been divided into four zones, each one their own part. I was in the Soviet zone, and uh, I had to find my wife. I said, uh, at first I didn't know, know everything was was crashed, uh, so I was taken to police headquarters, German police off headquarters. They said, what do you mean by flying? They said, don't give me that stuff. <laughs> Get your guys out there to play. I've been prosecuting the Nazi Einsatz group. But you're going to treat me as a war criminal. Get, get them out there and search them for. And so I really gave them hell. And then, then a policeman came in and he said some mumbled in German. He said, a woman jumped off a roof. Oh, a woman jumped off a roof. What did my wife? <laughs> One of them. And, uh, uh, he, I, so I get to let's go. I jumped into a police car with him and we went beep, 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 till we got to a, a house which was surrounded by people who crowd, go inside. And, uh, I, I, and uh, so I said, the second floor, I went up to the second floor and sure enough, there is my wife stretched out on the couch with a bandage on her head, and another bandage on her leg. And you'd think she would jump for joy. Well, that's these women, you know, she started to cry. <laughs> she thought I was dead. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint her. No. I have a picture over here on my desk. Mm -hmm. I keep it here forever. It says we were happily married without a quarrel in 74 years. Oh, incredible. So, anyway, herself and where's Mrs. Taylor? She was pregnant. So, I, I anyway, no, it's going to the detail. We, uh, I finally got a hold, uh, got out of the Eastern uh, Russian zone and the Eastern American zone. I said, look, tell for Taylor's, General Taylor's plane, where is it? And they said, well, look, everybody had bailed out. Yeah. And uh, well, yeah. Anyway, I found him in the hospital. He was already injured. Some of the other guys were injured a little bit on landing and Mary Taylor, gave birth, birth to a nice baby, John Taylor. Fantastic. <laughs> About a few months later, and uh, he's a hippie. <laughs> fantastic. So, it's a fantastic story, Ben. Um, if, we, if we can quickly move to the uh, questions that the audience are asking, and they're asking some great questions, uh, uh, we could spend many hours discussing them. If I could bundle the first three together and as quickly as you could, just touch on where your sort of your feelings about them. The first is that we see more and more 
Holocaust denial in uh, various parts of Europe. The populist yeah. leaders are challenging what we all know to be oh. true. You confirmed this. Uh, but nobody you... challenges in my presence. Yes, exactly. Nobody. Exactly. I, I, exactly. I will get into the camps as soon as they were liberated. As soon That's as we right. had word that we were approaching a camp, I got in my Jeep, painted in the front of an MRI line, always alone, because when they promoted me to sergeant, uh, I told the, the colonel, I said, just leave me alone. Just yeah. leave me alone. I'll get the job done. Right. And uh, I raced to the camp. Uh, there I saw uh, what should be well known by everybody, dead bodies lying on the ground, pleading for help with their eyes, people starving, groveling in the piles of garbage for something to eat, um, the crematoria going full, full blast, dead bodies piled up like cordwood in front of the crematorium, skin and bones waiting to be burned, uh, the SS fleeing, out to camp, Americans chasing him, some in, inmates catching some of the guards, killing them, uh, burning them alive. I've seen that too. Uh, horrors which were uh, indescribable. And, uh, and I would go from one camp to the next. Yeah. I couldn't, the, truck, the front was moving forward rapidly. I couldn't stay there very long in any one camp, but I head for the Schreibstube, which is the office. Um, and uh, I think I'll interrupt your, your question a little bit to tell you the true, true story. I come to one of the camps and the guard who was in charge of the records, he said, uh, oh, I've been waiting for you. I said, why? He said, look, I have this. And he, he took out of his pocket uh, a book, a little book, and he said, here I have the names of all the people who were in the camp because they were members of a, some evening club and they had to sign in when they got in and they, they got a stamp put in this in their little identity book and when the book was filled they got a new one and he instead of destroying the old one which he was supposed to do he hid them and uh, if they had caught him they would have killed him on the spot no doubt it would have put a hole right through his head every time he took one of those books and hit it. And he had about three or four of them. And he said, here. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So uh, he said, I've been waiting for you. Yeah. And uh, I was very touched that these people who were living on the verge of death at any moment still had enough hope in the future to put aside the vital evidence, which might help hold accountable yeah. those who are responsible for their condition. Yeah. So uh, it was a lesson for me in hope, never giving up, you know, and uh, no matter how grim it may look, uh, there'll be a day of reckoning. So, but the camps themselves were very similar. I went from one to another and uh, yeah. all, all grim, very, very grim and uh, uh, bloody bloody mess overall. So we were fighting going on in the camps by the time we got there. Uh, so it was, it was, no one could tell me it didn't happen. Didn't happen. Uh, you know, they, they, they wouldn't dare say that in my yeah. presence. I, I so. think you're absolutely right. And uh, they wouldn't, uh, <laughs> they wouldn't stand a no. moment because what argument could they really put before someone who uh, not just uh, was an we eyewitness? Cannot, we cannot depict the horror. That's we can right. imagine the horror right. of what it was like That's to be right. an inmate in such a place. That's uh, right. That's and, right. Um, and that has people have asked me, why do I do what I do? I do what I do because I can't help it. Ben, one of the questions raised by one of our audience members concerns the death penalty. Over the last 70, 80 years, there's been a progressive uh, removal of it as a means of punishment. I think the US is one of uh, now a small number of countries, or let's say the majority of countries have now ended the imposition of the use of the death penalty. So that you have some retention of states and the US is one of them. I, uh... Do you think, what do you feel about the death penalty now? And do you think that 
The question is, should there be an exception for international crimes where the I faced those who commit that, genocide and so as forth? As the chief prosecutor, it was usual that they recommended the penalty. I never asked for the death penalty because there could be no punishment which would equal the crimes. And uh, I thought, no, I got 22 defendants on a million people killed. Where can you balance the scales of something which is fair? The SS, the Einsatzgruppen uh, were created for the purpose of murdering all the Jews and any other potential enemies. And that's they did very effectively and stupidly, uh, happily from my point of view, had, I had the records, the daily records, indisputable. Every single member of the Einsatzgruppe and 3,000 members were responsible for direct or indirect participation in mass murder, no doubt whatsoever. And uh, so you couldn't do justice in a case like that. And what difference would it have made if we had executed these 10 or 12 people? Uh, what we have to do is we have to condemn with every means possible their behavior because their behavior is being repeated every place still today. And uh, therefore I come to the young people. We have glorified the killing of ma mass numbers of innocent people on the theory that they are the enemy. Uh, that they belong to another nationality. You can't continue doing that, kids. You can't do it. It's the wrong thing in the first place. We executed, we were sentenced to death, uh, 13 of my, my, my boys. They only executed four. There was different clemency actions came in between. In principle, uh, I don't think that it was unjust to execute the four who were actually, or if we'd executed all of them. So it depends on the nature of the crime. As a general matter, it's always unkind to kill somebody, take his life, no matter what the crime is. But uh, there can be circumstances. I didn't ask for the death penalty deliberately. I couldn't imagine anything which would be just under the circumstances. When I cut them up into a million parts and feed them to the dogs, it went through my mind. So, well, I can't do that. Uh, so. Uh, uh, taking a human life for a crime is always a difficult thing to do and should always be a last resort if you know it might, or would otherwise be repeated by the same person might be justifiable. But uh, we have a good example there of mass murder uh, by government decree and as known as going to war. And so I have come around to say the biggest place where they kill people is warfare itself. Yeah. War is genocide. And uh, to get people to give up what they have glorified for centuries, wave the flag, hooray for our military, and all that, wrong clue. Maybe it was good mm -hmm. in the good old days when you had only a horse and a bow and arrow. Uh, it's no good anymore, and it hasn't been any good for the last few wars either. Haven't you gotten the point? We're killing mostly innocent people. We're killing people who are deprived of their livelihood, you destroy their cities, their homes. What the hell kind of justice is that? So uh, I'm absolutely against war because every war that I've seen or been I'm involved in, I mean, they gave me battle stars. I don't I don't need the battle stars. I I I, I wouldn't I'd forego all the battle stars, just have peace stars, what they should have. Uh, so it's a tough question because we have glorified warfare, particularly uh, as a, the correct answer to many problems. It should very well be the very last answer, the very last resort, and there is no other choice. But uh, uh, it's not out of sympathy for criminals, but out of common sense and the uh, sympathy of those who have to live with the world afterwards. Yeah. I've always, I've always found one of the most difficult aspects about the death penalty is that whatever the crime uh, for which the person convicted and then sentenced to death, the family, the children of that defendant, if they, if they have children, 
uh, will suffer for the rest of the life for the you know for the, for their lives um, for a crime for which they have I mean it's just a blood tie but otherwise they're entirely innocent but they're also suffering. I think um, as you said it's almost a case by case basis the progressive sort of abolition um, of the, the the penalty is is a fact um, and I, it will be interesting to see how long it will take before most countries realize that they shouldn't be imposing it. Um, ben, before I we and we have a couple of minutes left, there is a case that one of the uh, audience members is asking uh, about your work on restitution and reparations. There's a case now before the Supreme Court regarding a forced sale of art and the return uh, of the art to the family uh, who once owned the art. Could you speak to this aspect of justice and how important it was not just to convict the guilty, but to assist and in as much as one is able to, the victims recover their belongings, recover the sense of dignity and so forth. If you could. Yes, I'd be very glad to do that because I was involved in all aspects of that, including the uh, art treasures which we found in a salt mine in Alta Alce, trying to restore to their owners. But the overall question of uh, I'm trying to think of where to begin with that. Uh, uh, well, how important is it for, for the com to complete the circle? When we talk about justice, it is fundamentally important that, that this, this issue be realized, isn't it? Yeah. The, uh, uh, well, every member of the Einsatz group and 3,000 men was a participant, as either directly, directly or co-conspirator of mass murder, no doubt whatsoever. And I tried. 22 of them. And uh, uh, did I have a feeling that justice was being done? No. Uh, did I feel that I felt that something had to be done? Yes. We couldn't just walk away. And uh, we couldn't just walk away from all the victims after you have ended the war, punished the principal criminals who were responsible for it. What about the victims? They had nothing but a tattoo on their arm. They lost everything. They killed their families. They destroyed their homes. They've had to flee their country. They were destitute. They were put into camps. They could hardly live on, they had to get out. So I recognized that there's this another phase of my life. It is first put an end to the war, stop the war, stop the killing. Next thing is you have to take care of the victims and see what they have suffered and how can you compensate. You can't compensate for a loss of, of a mother or father or life. And we didn't try. And the, I will mention here that the impetus came from Conrad Adenauer, who was the German chancellor, a devout Catholic, who made a speech in 1952 in which he said, terrible crimes have been committed in the name of the German people that imposes on us an obligation to try to make amends. And using that as a takeoff, the Jewish organizations all, all organized themselves and formed what they call a conference on Jewish material claims against Germany. I was already recovering airless property in Germany at that time. So I was experienced with, uh, it was under American military government law. If you took somebody's house away because it was a Jew, you had to return the house and you got back whatever you gave. That was a mission impossible, but we, uh, all kinds of technical reasons, but I already was experienced with that. And so I was the counsel to this conference and we had to draw up complicated laws. How do you measure the damage? How do you prove the damage? Who pays the money? And all of that problem, we had a group. Most of the things I did was in a group, uh, but we put a group together and we carried that from out. We, arranged and German government paid the West German government. The East German government said that there was a communist government. They said all the bad Nazis, they were in the East. They, they fled to West Germany. We didn't do anything. So there were all kinds of political, legal, technical problems, but that was the next thing. Uh, and the most important thing was left was stop war making completely. 
and I've been working on that day and night for I don't know how many years now. <laughs> Ever since the war ended. <laughs> and, uh, ben, uh, we've reached the end of our session. There's still many questions. I mean, this is the effect you always have on people. <laughs> you generate uh, further questions. Everyone has been enthralled by what it is that you've been saying. Um, really a huge honor for us. A few well, years ago, for me to be talking to you, the former United Nations Human Rights well, I don't know if you remember this, uh, Ben. At one stage, I felt embattled um, when I was the human rights chief, and you sent to me a very kind note, a supportive note. And at the at the end, you wrote, uh, you scrolled with your hand, you put. Uh, just keep screaming. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's what I keep saying. And I've been screaming ever since. <laughs> so so I, that's that's your instructions to all of us. I'm glad to see uh, you following my instructions. I'm I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. And, I hope the others will listen to that too. Thank you, Ben. And I'll now turn back to our director, Thank Michael. You. Nice Rich. seeing you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben and Zaid, for sharing those insights and taking the time to join us today. This event has been incredible. The, the airplane story alone was worth the price of admission. And we are so grateful to be able to hear about your experiences, insights, and beliefs about the future. And thanks to everyone for joining us. We hope to see you on Thursday for our final event of the semester, The Man Who Ran Washington, with Peter before Baker and Susan me. Glasser. Before you Sign leave up link that, is in the chat. Before you leave me, I want to tell you, Rita, Everything Please. is on my website. It's my name, www.benfriends.org. Everything is free. Books, articles, lectures, it's all there. So if you've been sleeping through this or had your eye on your girlfriend <laughs> instead, look at my website. You'll catch up with fast. Thank you very much. I hope everybody goes to Ben's website. And after you do that, uh, please consider following Perry Worldhouse uh, at Perry Worldhouse on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we've also dropped a link to the website into the chat so everyone can check it out uh, right now and go uh, read uh, uh, some of Ben's work, uh, see uh, videos of him speaking on, uh, on these impressive issues. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ben uh, and Zaid for, for educating us all and entertaining us all. Uh, on, on such an important and, and weighty subject. And we hope that everybody uh, stays safe out there uh, and has a great day. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you Ben. Thank you, Mike.